Okay, and like I said, I'm just going to read this real short article that's in the Concordia Commentary on Hebrews. And if you have any questions, just stop me, or we want to look something up. Before. But I, he did it. He, I'm not going to put it any plainer or simpler than the way he's doing it, so I'm just going to read what he said. Okay, he says, There are a few topics in which confusion reigns as much as the understanding of sacrifice in the Old Testament and in Hebrews. Confusion prevails at all levels of discussion, whether it be semantic, practical, conceptual, or theological. Three common misunderstandings distort the interpretation of what is meant by sacrifice in Hebrew. They are the use of sacrifice as a generic term to cover a wide range of offerings to God, the equation of sacrifice with the death of the victim, and the reduction of the varied functions of the offerings in the Bible to making atonement for sin. First, it may come as a surprise to many modern readers of the Bible that there is no generic term for sacrifice in the Old Testament. Instead, we are confronted with a confusing array of offerings, such as the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering. Though they are all interrelated by their presentation in the divine service, each of these was different in nature and purpose. What's more, they could be presented either as a national communal offering or as personal family offerings. While the burnt offering was the main national offering, the peace offering was the chief family offering. Despite their differences, they were all brought to the altar, where they were partially or wholly burnt up on it to produce a sweet-smelling cloud of smoke. By its contact with the Lord's altar, each offering was sanctified. The closest that we get to a general term for what was presented to God is the Hebrew noun and an offering. Uh, which literally means to make a sacrifice smoke. Uh, This noun is derived from blah, 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 more Hebrew. Uh, Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Thus the noun describes an offering as something that is brought near to God at the altar in the tabernacle or temple, whether it be a domesticated animal, flour, bread, olive oil, incense, or wine. The Septuagint, uh, that's the Greek Old Testament, does not, as we might expect, translate this generic term for an offering by... Prosothora, an offering, but by uh, Doron, a gift. The most general technical term for an offering in the Septuagint is the noun uh, Thysia, a sacrifice, a term that describes a peace offering, a burnt offering, and a grain offering, but not a sin offering or a guilt offering. He's explaining it, and it's still confusing, isn't it? In Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, the noun uh, Thyrsia is a sacrifice, is a general term for any kind of offering in both covenants, whether it is presented by, to God by the Levitical priests or by Jesus and the congregation through him. In contrast with the many sacrifices in the Septuagint, Hebrews speaks of a single sacrifice presented by Jesus, as well as the sacrifice of praise and the various sacrifices of well-doing that the congregation offers to God through him. Second, in the Old Testament, the slaughter and death of an animal as the victim had itself little or no ritual and theological significance. An animal was not sacrificed merely by killing it. Thus, the animal was not slaughtered on the altar, but elsewhere in the courtyard of the tabernacle or temple. Its ritual slaughter was a preparatory act, for by it all the blood was drained from the animal before it was splashed against the altar and poured out on it. The rite of atonement was not accomplished, simply by the death of the animal, but with the application of its blood on the most holy altar, whether it be by the blood being splashed on the four sides or poured out at its base. By that enactment, the priests and the people were released from sin and cleansed from its impurity. After that had been done, they could approach God safely without incurring his wrath by the desecration of his holiness. The rite of atonement was performed not just with the blood from the burnt offering, but also with the blood from all the other animals that were offered to God. The blood of the victim atoned for sin by its application on the altar for burnt offering. All animal sacrifices were therefore offered for the sins of the priests and the people. There is a major shift in emphasis from this in Hebrews, for in the New Testament, the death of Jesus is much more significant than the death of any animal in the Old Testament. Jesus does God's will by presenting his body, is a vicarious offering to atone for sin, and that's Hebrews 10, 5 to 14, and to free sinners from slavery to the fear of death by his death on their behalf, uh, 2, 14, and 15, which we've talked about. He tastes death on behalf of everyone to redeem them from sin, but his self-sacrifice is much broader than just his death. 
It also includes the whole of his bodily life on earth, his willing, passive, and active obedience to God with his prayers for deliverance from death, his presentation of himself with his blood before God in the heavenly sanctuary at his exaltation, and the sprinkling of the congregation with his blood to cleanse their hearts from sin. His work to atone for sin includes his ongoing heavenly ministry. In keeping with the sacrificial significance of his death and its ongoing relevance, the main emphasis in Hebrews is on the cleansing, remission, and sanctification through his sacrificed blood. Third, the presentation of the daily communal burnt offering each morning and evening provided the ritual framework for all the other offerings. It consisted of four basic enactments, the splashing of blood from a slaughtered male lamb against the altar in the rite of atonement, the entry of the high priest or his deputy into the holy place to burn incense as an act of intercession by the high priest on behalf of the people, the burning up of the meat and flour of the burnt offering with the performance of the Aaronic benediction by the high priest in front of the altar, and the eating of the leftover flour as most holy bread by the priests on duty. The basic purpose of that complex enactment was for God to meet with his people in order to purify, accept, sanctify, and bless them. So when we speak of sacrifices in Hebrews, we need to distinguish between these four enactments, each of which has its own complementary purpose as a part of the whole divine service. It is, of course, true that Hebrews does not emphasize the application of blood for the forgiveness of sins in the rite of atonement, but it does not reduce the sacrifice of Christ to a single purpose. The other three aspects of the full sacrificial enactment are also mentioned. As high priest, Jesus appears before God in heaven on behalf of the congregation and intercedes for them there. As high priest, he also offered himself with his prayers and his human body as an offering to God and offered up himself for the sins of the people. The result of his self-sacrifice is a sacrificial meal for the congregation rather than for the Levitical priests. He provides his holy supper in which the communicants feast on his body and blood, given and shed for them for the forgiveness of sins. Yet despite these Old Testament precedents and parallels, the sacrifice of Christ transcends the order of sacrifice in the Old Testament and differs from it. It falls into four main phases, the presentation of his body as an offering to God by his obedient and sacrificial death, his entry as high priest with his blood into the heavenly sanctuary, his ongoing intercession on behalf of God's people, and his sprinkling of the congregation with his blood for purification from sin and his sanctification of them through his blood. While the first two phases of his self-offering were done once for all and then never repeated, the last two continue in the divine service. There the congregation draws near to God through Jesus and his high priestly intercession for them. There he cleanses and sanctifies them with his blood so that they can enter God's presence through his flesh and with his blood. So the, the big thing I took away from all that is just the way we tend to talk about the sacrifices in the Old Testament as the sacrifices, right? And so when we say that, we do typically think of animal on the altar being burned up. That's the sacrifice. But it's all the other stuff that goes with it that's a part of it that had to be done correctly. Uh, all of the high priests doing their job and then the high priests uh, eating their portion of it when it's over. So it's uh, it's not just, okay, we put it on the altar, it burned up, we're done. Uh, just like Christ, as I said, Christ died once for all for the sins of the world on the cross, but the benefit of that is ongoing and active, right? So we receive the gifts won for us on the cross when we pray, when we go to, to church, when we receive the Lord's Supper, baptism also. Uh, so this is a living and active uh, atonement that is taking place. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so we just use that term sacrifice kind of broadly, and then we tend to think of this one specific act, and then we leave it alone. Okay. So if you look at the little page on in the book, the little booklet, now we'll talk about all the different kinds of sacrifice. And next time I'll, I'll be a little better prepared. We'll be able to watch the video I found. I forgot my computer. Okay, so as we did find out in the last couple of weeks, much of Leviticus contains detailed explanation of the various sacrifices offered in the tabernacle. And we have these five different kinds. 
So first we have the burnt offering. So in all the other offerings, only a bit of the offering itself was offered, and then the rest was eaten by the priests as part of the act of atonement. But in the burnt offering, the entire sacrifice is, is in sacrifices consumed on the altar, not just a part. So that offering is designed to make atonement for the offerer's sin, and we'll get to that. Okay, the grain offering is, and that's in tells you where in Leviticus you can find this, um, is an offering or gift to God from one's crops, and then a portion is kept by the priests uh, for their share. So, you know, the the tribe, of, the Levites were not allowed to own land. They weren't allowed to possess everything. They were dependent on the other tribes to provide for them. And this is one way they're provided for with food. And then there's the peace offering or the fellowship offering, uh, which was accomplished by the communal celebration of the worshipers who shared in the meat of the offering. And there's three subtypes of that. The thank offering which was offered for thanksgiving, for deliverance, or for blessings from God. The votive sacrifice was offered to give thanks for a blessing or deliverance after you make a vow. So a lot of times they would say, okay, I, I vow to sacrifice you know, 10 bulls uh, if you uh, help us vanquish our enemies in this battle. And then God delivers, and then, okay, i got to make good with the 10, with the ten animals. So that's a, a sacrifice given because you made a vow to do it. Then the free will sacrifice was joyously and willingly presented to express a general thankfulness of, to God with no specific deliverance in mind. You just felt like making a sacrifice. You were moved to do so. Then you have the sin offering, or we call it a purification offering. Uh, and these two are similar. The purpose of the sin, of sin and guilt offering, the sin offering... Uh, is to purify people from an unwitting sin. So the priest has to partake of that sacrifice also. So that is the, that is the th- sacrifice for the sins that you knew you must have done it, but you don't necessarily know you did it, or an unwitting sin. So you did something and you didn't realize it was a sin. Uh, we have that a lot, don't we? You know, it's kind of like, I always think of when, when the Reformation happened and all of a sudden we didn't have to enumerate every single one of our sins because who can do that? Who can remember every little tiny detail? And uh, that was the thing that drove Luther crazy because he would go to confession and he would confess all this stuff. And as soon as he leave, oh, I remembered something else. And he'd go back in and he was driving his father confessor crazy. Uh, as well as himself, with the uh, with the guilt, uh, guilty conscience, and, and burden of his uh, the burden of his soul for thinking he has carried all these things around that he wasn't forgiven for. So uh, that's kind of like the you know the sins that we confess on Sunday morning. It's like we know we know we've committed these. We don't know necessarily what they are, but we ask for forgiveness anyway because we know we did them. And then you have the guilt offering, or they call it the reparation offering. So that's different because there's a restitution required, uh, either to God or to another person, more often to another person. So you have to, you want to make atonement for uh, desecration or mishandling of things which are sacred. Uh, so uh, whenever you do something ritually incorrectly or, or what have you, you offer this guilt offering for not following the rules uh, because there's a rule for that, ironically. Now, we never really go without sin. Oh, no. Not at all. So, in other words, anytime and always we need to repent. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what I like about... That's what I like about Luther's, more, or especially Luther's evening prayer, uh, you know, you say, you know, I thank you, my friend, for graciously keeping this, this day and graciously keep me this night. Forgive me all my sins where I've done wrong. It kind of saying, I knew I did a bunch of stuff. I don't necessarily know what they are, but God, you know what they are, and forgive me for those too. Kind of. Um, sometimes people think that that's kind of a cop out. It's like, well, you're asking for forgiveness something for something you didn't know you did. So how are you repentant for it? Yeah. We could probably get into a circular argument about that and be here for days. 
Uh, I think it'd be interesting to see what uh, what the Mishnah, the Jewish Mishnah, says about it. As I'm sure they argued at great length about that kind of stuff. Or you repent, ask God to forgive you for sins you might commit, and then so you know. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead. Cause yeah, like a preemptive, you know, preemptive, uh, yeah. preemptive confession. It's like I know I'm about probably going to do something bad doing this. So, yeah. So that we had indulgences for. Oh yeah, this is what you have indulgences for, for sure. It's like, well, I know I'm going to do this, so I'll just go buy an indulgence. Okay, so that is all of the different sacrifices, most of all of these sacrifices. Right, but that's not all there is to it. So I think this is the part many people forget. You still have to be repentant before you can offer the sacrifice. So that's what we're kind of talking about, these sins we didn't know we'd do. But we have a guilty conscience about it, which the guilty conscience is our mind's way of telling you, yeah, you know you you don't understand what you did, but you know you did something. Uh, So it wasn't just going through the ritual of the sacrifices and your sin was forgiven. To be an actual sacrifice, you have to be sincerely repentant. God doesn't want your sacrifices without without repentance because it doesn't mean anything. Um, and where is it? It says, uh, you know, rather than Jesus said it to somebody, quoting the Old Testament. And it says, you know, that basically God doesn't desire sacrifices. What he, he has more joy over, you know, a single sinner that repents. Where was that? That sounds like John. They better remember where that is. Isaiah? Oh, Isaiah. Micah 6 8. Yeah, he was, yeah, I know he's quoting one of the prophets. Yeah. Okay, Micah 6 8. I like that you guys know your Old Testament so well. Like, yeah, he has shown you, O oh man, what yeah. is good. So what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God? Yes. And I know the one you're talking about that he doesn't require right. offering and sacrifices. What he requires is a contrite heart. Right, exactly. You know, like here, uh, then there's this passage from Isaiah 1 here. Yeah, the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of ram and fat, fat animals. I have no pleasure. Stop bringing meaningless <laughs> offerings. So you can't just go through the motions of doing the sacrifice and think that that worked. You still have to be repentant. And... And I was actually, forget who taught us this, but we were actually taught, it's one way of looking at it, that the sins are already forgiven by the time you came to the altar with the sacrifice. The sacrifice was just kind of the last step, but you'd already been repentant. You want to be forgiven. That's why you're there with the sacrifice. So the sacrifice was already kind of a thanksgiving for God forgiving you, even though you had to burn up the animal or sacrifice the animal, go through the the ritual for the cycle of atonement to be complete. But you had to have that. The first part was the important part. And of course, once the temple was destroyed, the sacrificial system is gone. That's all you had. You didn't have, you weren't uh, slaughtering animals. You were just praying basically and confessing. Okay, so whether it be the Old Testament sacrificial system, whether it be confession and absolution today, uh, you have to be contrite, repentant, ask for forgiveness, and then it will be done for us as we believe because blood was shed in the Old Testament or because Christ shed his blood on the cross uh, for us. But I think we still have to go beyond why we did it. Hmm? I, I still think we have to go far enough to say why we did it. You know, I can, we, we you know, I'm going to be like Luther, you know, be here till Jesus come time about what we did. You know? mm-hmm. But if I'm going to get up on my knees and go tomorrow and do the same thing, you know, why taking those thoughts captive that would keep you from, you know, at least, okay, now I, I want to get rid of the, the reason, not right. the sin. Yeah, because sometimes the sin is the symptom of the greater sin. Exactly. So if you don't, I mean, yeah, I, 
whatever serial sin someone may have where they're doing the same thing over and over and over. It's like, okay, what's the behavior that's causing that to happen over and over? That's what you need to work on. The other thing is just a sign pointing you back to it. So that's exactly right. And that's one of the, one of the downfalls, I feel, as an ex-Catholic, of confession, you know, of Friday night. Because it, it, it's ritualistic, it becomes mm -hmm. ritualistic and necessary so I can go to communion, you know. But you're going to go back Monday and do the same thing. So, right. And it, it just, I don't know, it's the yeah, so you more can, I did it, the less I liked it. Yeah, so, <laughs> so you can you can rattle your rosary and then you can, you know, do all the rote prayer so fast to get it done as quick as possible. As long as the words come out of your mouth, they count. And then, well, you're going to do it tomorrow. So like, it's kind of like how the guys in the mafia have to like burn a saint when they get made and they have to, uh, you know, basically say that the the... The family is above God, and yet these clowns go to confession every week, and they do the same stuff over and over and over. So, are their sins actually forgiven? No, because they haven't corrected the behavior. They're in like, they're in trouble. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and I mean that goes for all of us. We all do. There's all th things that we do over and over, and uh, what it boils down to is we just don't actually think it's a sin. We we kind of know, yeah, God doesn't like that, but I'm okay. Yeah, you're not as bad as the guy next door that did that. Right. So oh, thank God I'm not like this guy over here. Yeah. We worship by road. We confess by road. We think we're forgiven by road. Just, yep. you know, religion becomes just another something that I have. Oh, I have to do that. Oh, today's Saturday. I got to eat No. Well, we do that with everything, don't we? I mean, so many people, you know, got to get the baby baptized because it's the first box on the list. And then, you know, I have to get confirmed. So make sure I go to confirmation. I check that off the list. I should probably get married in church. So check that off the list. And then, okay, I'm leaving a letter for my family when I die. That's the last thing I got to check off the list is you got to take me back to the church before they put me in the ground. Uh, yeah, we love doing that. We love having checklists and just, okay, well, if I do all these things, I'll be okay. Yeah, no, that's not how it works. But It's pretty it, hard, though, to ask for forgiveness without having a human nature want to do something. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's almost impossible. Yeah, I mean, we're sorry, but we're not sorry. That's our meme, one of the memes today, right? Sorry, not sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, because, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, but I'd do it again. It's like, yeah, I, I'm sorry I did that, but if I had to do it again, I'd do it exactly the same. Well, then you're not sorry. I'm sorry you know? Huh? I'm sorry, I'm sorry I got caught. That's exactly right. <laughs> well, and in, and in a system where you're sorry I got caught, then the attractiveness of just do these things and you'll be okay. Go say 10,000 Our Fathers and 50 Hail Marys and, and all will be forgiven. Or, okay, we'll pick you up, we'll put you in jail, and in, in you know 24 months, you'll be out and you'll be good to go. That's human reason. You know, we like that. Okay, actions have consequences. Then when you pay the penalty for the, the consequence, then, I'll, then go forth and do what you got to do. Uh, but God doesn't work that way. That's one of those those critical, yeah, our ways are not God's ways, and we don't understand God's ways. Good. Yeah, good discussion. Because especially with, with like doing adult confirmation and whatever, the, the whole idea of, well, how do I know if I'm really actually repentant about this? Because you can't be forgiven unless you're sorry. So how do I know if I don't feel like I'm sorry? What? Yeah, that's that's a tough I one. Break, I, I don't break down and cry about something where other people would just fall apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, we're non. Sometimes we're nonchalant about it, and that's yeah. just again, that's human nature. But other times, it's like okay, you just kind of look yourself in the mirror and go, yeah, 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 I did that. That's what is wrong with me, <laughs> you know. It's like, okay, and, it's, and that, that's that whole part about, you know, Lord, help me to do better. I want to do better. Uh, that's actually the part of the right of private confession is, you know, you go in. Anybody ever done that? Ever? Yes. Okay, so so you go in, you've done it. I don't know how, I don't know what the what the, the right is in the Roman Catholic Church nowadays, but the like ours is, we actually still have this thing, if you ever... If you ever happen have something happen that's just weighing on your conscience so much that you need, we understand 
Christ is standing there and forgiving you on Sunday morning, but sometimes you need another human being standing in his stud to put your, his hand on your head and go, you're forgiven. That's the emotional part of it, and it's really powerful. But you, you go, you close the door, you sit and you, and you talk, and you can talk as much as you want or just say, yeah, I've got this thing I'm not comfortable saying out loud, but I know that it's wrong. I, and one of the things that right is I know I have sinned. I want to do better is actually the words in the right that the the person seeking absolution says. You know, so you have to, you're coming before God. It's not enough that you're sorry you did this and you're seeking forgiveness, but you have the active desire to not do it again. Uh, Does that mean we're not going to do it again? Not necessarily. How many times do we do the same things over and over, right? We're kind of dumb like that. If we can find a scripture verse to pray with it after you know well, with the uh, after you have mm-hmm. you feel good. That's the only. But that's my recommendation mm-hmm. <laughs> is that just to say you're sorry, and even though you, even in your heart you feel sorry, it's it's still just you. Yeah. You haven't put God in it. You told me that you know that, that you're sorry, and you really mean it. Mm-hmm. But you have not asked him to help you get over this or around it, however, whatever you want to do. Use it for his glory if, in fact, I have to have it at all. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, you, you know, you're seeking absolution for something, but then you're actively seeking to correct the behavior or not repeat the behavior. Right. Yeah, that's what a, a, a professor of mine said when you're trying to resist temptation. It's like, well, what do you do when you're tempted to... And they're talking to guys about like internet pornography or talking about, you know, drinking or, or whatever bad habits guys have uh, and the, our, you know, sinful habits guys have. And it says, OK, so when that temptation's coming, you should have some, memorize some Bible verses because that's your ammunition. So when the temptation comes up, we'll just start going through those and you'll very likely find very often that just the, the mere thought of, you know, God, first off, God's watching you dummy uh the, the fact that you're just using his word back to him like that it's like okay this this is what i've got to do i believe this and then, then you'll find that temptation lightens if it doesn't go completely away um, is it magic incantations no but god's word is living active and powerful that's what you you put him in the confession with you you can confess to him yeah, and you're surrendering control. And you're surrendering control. You you have to invite him into your agony, invite right. him into your situation, into whatever it is. And then the two t- together, it will, you know, you have more, a better chance of, I'm not saying even overcoming, but it, yeah, you know, overcoming it. But it, it's just to, the ritual or the road to going to confession, it's just you telling him and that's it, you know. Right. We have to invite him into everything. To, we have to invite him into our sin if we ever want to be free of it or as free as we're going to be. Yeah, we have I mean, to invite him into our, our the attitude that we don't want it anymore. It's not just us telling him, okay, you do it, now fix it. it doesn't oh, matter. I think so. I mean, I wouldn't, I, will, I wouldn't use the word invite personally. That's me, but the but I would say you know stop resisting. He's there to help. He wants to help. We're the ones that don't want help. So I would would say yeah, he is actively seeking to you know, be there with you. He's promised to do that, and we again in our sin we push him out and we do not let him do what he wants. We do not let him work. So we resist. We resist the Holy Spirit. Good. I like that. I don't know if. Um... You know, years ago, they used to have private confessions. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if any of you ever had that, but mm-hmm. of course, we only had communion maybe four times a year, you know. And then they would come to the pastor, and and uh, they would have to go to confessions before they, you know, could go to communion Sunday. Um, it's a chance to speak to the pastor, I guess. I'm not sure. It kind of limits you to. What you're going to confess. Yeah, what you're going to remember, sure. Yeah, what you can remember. Yeah, the thing is, though, uh, and people don't necessarily think of it that way, is you, like, yeah, you're in the room with the pastor, he's listening to you, but he's not hearing you. God hears you. You know, the way, 
the way I always explain it is it goes from your mouth to God's ears. I'm just the in-between. And as soon as this is over, I don't remember it because I didn't hear it. You didn't say it to me. And that's, they call it having ears like a tomb. So that's, you don't repeat it because you never heard it in the first place. You're just a conduit, uh, which is a really neat way of looking at it. That, that you know, you can't ever divulge or say or remember, even with the person who confessed it, you're just like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, it's like God says, he, when he forgives, and he also, he forgets your sins. Those are, they're forgiven, they're forgotten. Uh, so we can do no less. We got to vote, well, not to, uh, what I, when you, using the word invite, right, you know, say invite him into. I know what you mean. That would be, to me, that was what, when I say that, when the Holy Spirit said, okay, come do something. You know, show me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's what I mean when I say. Oh, I know. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I, yeah, I, yeah, so he's, I, I'm gonna invite him. I know what you meant. <laughs> that's just that's just the thing. We got. I have to be careful when I start telling people to. Oh, you know, yeah, invite because they're like, yeah. wait a minute, do we Lutheran did. It's like, no, let's not go there. That. Yeah, it just makes things complicated. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's like, well, he's there. It's like help. <laughs> But it's like, how can you have such a powerful help with you and not ask? It's like, yeah, I got, just, yeah, I'll call you off the bench in a minute, Holy Spirit, I got this. Like, how often does that work? Not, not, not too well at all. Okay, so you've got uh, these different kinds of sacrifices. Could they have found a more gnarly looking goat for that picture of the scapegoat? Thing looks like it's going to die right then and there. Okay, so special sacrifices, and yeah, there's, you can, I find the stuff about the scapegoat and the Day of Atonement to be very interesting to read in the Old Testament, so that's Leviticus 16. Uh, but the morning and evening sacrifices, um, I think what the morning and evening sacrifices really turned into for us is morning and evening prayer. You know, let my prayers rise before you, the lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice, and then let my prayers rise before you as incense. That's all imagery directly, well, from the Psalms, but directly from, from what they used to do. And now, as we read back at the beginning, is that now our prayers and our thanksgivings are our sacrifices. That's what's left of that sacrificial system, the good stuff, if you will. Okay, so morning and evening, you had to uh, slaughter a lamb. In the morning and one at twilight. And then you had special Sabbath ones and monthly ones. And then uh, I guess that was noisy offering Sunday. Then Passover it was a very special one. They had the special rules for the Passover lamb. Uh, and you can read that in three different places. And then the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. So the day each year where the high priest seeks atonement for the sins of the entire nation of Israel. So first, he's got to make a sacrifice for his own sins because he can't uh, stand for the people if he is unforgiven. And then they take two goats. One is the goat to be the sin offering for the people, uh, which gets sprinkled on the holy of Hol the, uh, the mercy seat of the ark in the holy of holies. And then on the scapegoat, that's when the high priest actually puts his hand on the animal and puts the sins of Israel on the animal, which then goes out into the wilderness to die. So that is the foreshadowing of Christ. So on Christ, all of our sins were placed and then he was abandoned to die. Of course, then he was took his life up again, a little different. So There's a, a Jewish tradition with the scapegoat that there was a an appointed man who will take the scapegoat into the wilderness and push it off the cliff. Ah, okay, I did not know that. And then that's a tradition. Because I always wonder what happens if the scapegoat comes yeah. walking back. <laughs> <We> push it <laughs> off. It's like, it's back, everyone run away. You push it off the cliff, so the goat dies with the sin. Yeah, because the man has to come back to did that. And it, isn't he ritually clean? Right, because he's unclean he, now. He has been. No. Contaminated. And I can't remember the, the, the book that, that said that, that was the Jewish tradition. I'll have to I believe it. Look it up. I can't remember what it was. How about the Passover lamb? 
How many times a year did a, a, just an average family have to make sacrifices? That, all of these sacrifices that... That I don't know. Um, it's kind of expensive. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. It definitely gets yeah. definitely gets expensive. Uh, that I don't know. Um, I, I know they had these. They, you had the daily sacrifices that everybody had to contribute to. Uh, so that was probably like temple tax, even though they didn't have temple yet. Uh, and then the familial offerings, which still had to come to the tabernacle. How often they had to do that, I don't know. Because many of them would have to travel a great distance. Oh yeah, when the when when the temple was in Jerusalem, yes. Absolutely. Now, like in the wilderness with the tabernacle, they're right there. But yes. but how that worked and how often each family had to do that, I don't know. But they did have monthly offerings, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, what am I? What was I looking up? Oh, right. Uh, and then, if the if the priests are sacrificing these many animals, let's say on a weekly basis, <laughs> they can't eat all that meat. No, they can't. I mean, some of the sacrifices were completely burned on the altar, and some were not. That's what that's what that part back a couple yes, pages was dealing with. But, but still, yeah, that's a lot. So, did the people? Well, the people ate. No, the people also, ate. Okay. yeah. If that was like your family offering, the Levites didn't keep it all. You ate that. Yeah. So everybody ate. Everybody ate. Just so it wasn't wasted. No. Yes. Exactly. I mean. Oh, well, I years time, it's thousands of animals. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. Sure. So somebody has to be raising those. Yeah, and then when you consider in the temple in Jesus' time, when people would bring their animal from home for however far they had to travel, it's like, oh, that's not clean enough. You have to buy one of ours. It's like, mm -hmm. wow, how could those people afford that? Like you said. Right. It's like, okay, now I brought this animal that... We're probably going to have to kill it and eat it here anyway because you're not going to feed it all the way back home. It wouldn't be make sense, and we have to buy something. So, yeah, it, it's complicated. As far as the morning and evening sacrifices in Numbers 28, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel, and say to them, My offering, my food, or my offerings made by fire is a sweet aroma to me. You shall be careful to offer to me at the appointed time. And you shall say to them, this is the offering made by fire which you shall offer to the Lord. Two male lambs in the first year without blemish, day by day, as a regular burnt offering. Mm -hmm. One in the morning, one in the evening. Mm -hmm. yep. That's not each family that has to do that. No, that's, that's the community. Yeah, that's the community, morning and evening sacrifice. Right. And then they have the monthly one that's in uh, Numbers twenty-eight, eleven. At the beginning of each of your months you shall present... Mm -hmm. Two bulls and one ram, etc. And then the Passover, and then yeah, on the seventh month they will have a holy convocation, and they have another set of sin offerings. Yeah, there's a bunch. There's there's a lot of offerings. Okay, so that's then. Then we have the steps for uh, going through the offering. It's in Leviticus one. Uh, so first of all, it has to be without blemish, right? Uh, so it's got to be a perfect animal. It's like, well, why did it have to be a perfect animal? Well, because sin costs, as it says here in the little booklet. Like, it, sin's expensive. So when you have to make a sacrifice for sin, the sacrifice has to be perfect, absolutely perfect. Well, why would you want to offer God right. something that's defective? Yeah, I mean... I that would be a mindset that you have to... Uh, how repentant can you be? Right? I mean, it's like, it, what if our altar pyramids... It's like, oh, we need a new altar pyramids for, for Easter. So here's some raggy, faded, shredded old ones that we found. They're white. Throw that on the, on the altar. That's good enough. Like, we would never do that, right? Yeah. You would never... It's like, those things are... You want nice ones? They're expensive. That's what it costs to, to do something like that because it's got to be right. It's got to be beautiful. Well, same thing with the animals. They had to be perfect. Um, you have to lay hands on the head of the animal. That's uh, imparting one's sins to the animal. Uh, it's ritual. But always, the, uh, always with the laying on of hands. 
and then the offerer slaughters the animal. Uh, so the priest doesn't do the killing, the offerer does the killing. And then the priest collects the blood and sprinkles it against the altar. Uh, they hold the basin to collect it and then sprinkle it on the altar for the life of a creature is in the blood and I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar is blood that makes atonement for one's life, Leviticus 17.11. And then you skin it and cut it in pieces uh, because you have to get dirty to make the sacrifice. You have to get bloody. Is it? Uh, we um, have to get back number four. Uh, for the life of a creature is in the blood. Is that not something that the, uh, why is a Jehovah's Witnesses don't have blood transfusions? Yeah. Yeah, and there was, a mis there was some beliefs in the Middle Ages about that too uh, when they were first figuring stuff out that, that putting someone else's blood inside you is like a blood transfusion is the same as eating it. And it's like, no... Or whatever, but yes, that's that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses do. Oh, you know, and that was the proscription against eating blood in in the Old Testament ceremonial law, which of course then when Jesus comes along in John six six yeah John six, and says unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you cannot enter the kingdom of God and everybody's like what did he just say? So first off, we can't eat blood. Second off, you're another person. So how are you going to do that? But but that's where, you know, that's where Jesus broke with that old system. It's like, yeah, the life is in the blood. My blood gives you life. But my blood is special. My blood is different. So that's, so that's where that uh, fades away. Okay, so there's all this ritual, basically, is the short version. Is there are all these, all kinds of rituals and minutiae of how to do it, what to do it. Uh, we don't have that. <laughs> I mean, we have our rights, we have our rituals, we have how we do things, and it's the way we've always done it. But, but none of that is actually come down from God, you have to do it this way or it's unacceptable. We don't do that. You know, only, only certain things. You know, baptism, it's got to be water, and you have to use the name of the triune God. And then the Lord's Supper, it's got to be wine, and it's got to be bread. And that's it. That's... The only thing we have to do the way we do. We have other trappings that we pull from the Old Testament, like our candle stands. Well, you guys are here, don't. But most, most of the time, the sanctuary candle stands, are set, there's seven candles on each one, just like the one in the tabernacle. Uh, so we bring all that stuff kind of forward because uh, that's just how things evolve. Right? You keep some rituals and you discard others. That the goal was baptism being dunked versus sprinkled. Um, versus sprinkled. Oh, what was that? Baptism. Uh, some say that you know you have to be immersed, you know, mm -hmm. and some say immersed sprinkled just means apply water. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That that word the Greek word baptizo just means wash. So, and then we keep it. We transliterate it into English as baptism, but it just means wash. So. Uh, in fact, this Sunday's first reading from Acts is going to be the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, like, look, here is water. What's to prevent me from being baptized? Nothing. Let's do this. You know, can it, we go through this with the confirmation kids. What kind of water has it got to be? Can it be mud puddle water? Yeah. Can it be toilet water? Yeah. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but yeah, if that's all you got. And your drainage ditch water, whatever, it's water. And nothing says it has to be clean. It just has to be water. Um, does it have to be wine? Yes, because fruit of the vine means wine. Uh, and bread, but it doesn't say what kind of bread. We use unleavened bread because the Israelites used unleavened bread, but does it have to be? Some churches bake a loaf of bread for communion when they have it, a little tiny one, and they actually literally break a piece off and hand it to you. Uh, and it's usually really, really good bread, by the way. <laughs> Our church in North Carolina did it. Yeah, yeah. So they'll have a little special loaf of bread just for that. Um, yeah, Goddard's Church down in Kentucky does that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nice. Um, so white bread, wheat bread, rye bread, pumpernickel bread. I like pumpernickel. 
So it doesn't matter what kind of bread, but and and, and then people get into says, well, it's got to be red wine. It's got to be unleavened bread. You know, it's got to be the little flat wafers. Whoever invented those things. Huh. Oh. So yeah, we keep some things and, and we discard others. Okay, and then the priest participates in the, and this will get back into our discussion when we start looking at how we are co-priests with Christ uh, and how we are the same and different from the priests in the Old Testament. But some of these things do have parallels. Uh, so we'll go through that pretty quick. Okay, so the priests participate in this sacrifice, and then we have that, that chapter from Leviticus 10 of they offered, un, you know, Nadab and Abihu offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, and they uh, <laughs> died for it. So sacrifices are serious business. So if you don't do it, I mean, that was... That's just the way God was in the Old Testament. That was the way God was with his people, just like the sacrificial animals had to be so perfect without blemish of a certain age. Everything had to be just so. God's people had to be just so. So the rest of the world would go, those people are different from everybody else. Why is that? And because Christ would come from that line of people. Uh, so... God handled them rough when they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Because people ask, like, why was God so smitey in the Old Testament? He's not like that now. It's like, well, he was like that to his people and his people's enemies then uh, because they were, because he set them apart to be so different. Uh, so, yeah, don't, don't get drunk and offer uh, sacrifices the wrong way because you, or you'll, get in, you'll get in trouble. Huh? Smiting. Smiting, yeah. Uh, Perfectly, don't bring any burn, any animals to burn on our altar anyhow, so. Yeah. It might have caused some problems, with, especially with the insurance company. Yeah, it's like, what are you guys doing? We're just offering sacrifice. You know what the thing is? Is, is like probably if Christians tried to do that, they just go, yeah, you can't do that. And it's like, oh, well, we're neo-pagans that we brought this ritual of our people back from, you know, Norway or something. And they'll go, oh, okay, we have to allow that. We'll have to make an exception for you. But Christians want to do it. That's illegal because that's the way the world works. Yeah, right. And then Aaron's remaining sons... And, and Aaron neglected the rest of the ritual. Like once their, once their brothers were like killed for doing this, they themselves didn't do it. Right? They didn't finish things the way they were supposed to be, which of course, you know, Moses read them the business. It's like, look, you've got to do this. You have to eat the, you know, the, the sin offering has to be eaten in a certain place. You know, and since his blood was not taken into the holy place, he should have eaten it in the sanctuary as I commanded. Yeah. So God demands holiness and obedience. These are some points that the author of this uh, made. God demands holiness and obedience from his servants, right? In our day, yeah, we don't really understand God's holiness uh, because we don't have all of these rituals to go through. Uh, and then we tend to think of people who think of themselves as being holy as there's something wrong with like, who do you think you are kind of thing. Whereas you had to, like, who do you think you are? You've got to do this. You've got to go through all. If you think, if you want to be holy, you have to do these things. Uh, God demands a pure heart. Uh, you know, like Jesus said, if you're offering your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, go and make that sin right before you, you know, stop what you're doing. Go make it right before you come back and, and, uh, make your sacrifice at the altar, you know, just like, should we come, if we have something that we have, you know, we're, we're bearing a grudge against our brother. I'm using figurative brother here. And it's like, I know 
there's bad blood between me and this guy, and we have the Lord's Supper today, and it's not good between us. Should we go to the Lord's Supper? Probably not. No, you should, guys should go work that out, and then you because you can't kneel at the altar next to each other like everything's okay. I mean, yes, we do that. We do receive forgiveness of sins in the Lord's Supper, but it is primarily a strengthening of faith, a you know, an inoculation against the world. And if you are discerning the body and blood correctly, then you know you can't be having that ill will against this guy right next to you while you're sitting there expecting to receive Christ's body and blood. So you guys should go work that out. All this stuff is hidden from everybody's eyes because we can't see into hearts. But it's like, yeah, if you if you guys are having a feud, especially if it's public, is the example we can use. You know, if it's a public feud and these two clowns go up to the rail together, that pastor should say, yeah, no, go. You guys gonna need to go work this out before you come up here. Uh, you had enough time during the offertory. <laughs> <laughs> because true story, gospel forty nine. I like this. <laughs> yeah. Do you have enough time during the offertory? This ought to be good. <laughs> One Sunday on the way to church, George and I had exchanged a few words. And we came in. Loving, loving words. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Came in the door. Good morning. How's everybody? Oh, we're here. And I opened with the open sanctuary door. I saw the elements. Oh man! <laughs> like nope. <laughs> so I went in and said my prayers. Offered to him was just long enough. George was ushering. I got up in the back and went to the side. <laughs> and I didn't apologize for my attitude. I apologized for the way I said it. You know, we could have the discussion when we get over. But I had said some unkind words in the you know. And uh, he understood. I said, this. he kind of looked at me and said, this communion is oh, <laughs> So, nice. your offertory hymns long because it's a wonderful time for confession. <laughs> if we get them again. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it, it usually does yourself a lot of good when you talk to someone, you know, about what, what you feel. If you mm -hmm. had them. And, and if you really discuss it with them, it's amazing how much freer your body becomes. Yeah, it's always been you know, one of those things where you're dreading that conversation. It's like, I don't want to get into this with them. And, you know, it's like, you know, like say it's your boss because I had a real winner. <laughs> Him and I, boy, did we have some good fights. But because we had the best interests of the company in mind. But we fought because that's what you do when you spend more time with these people than you do your own family, right? So we had... We had a knockdown drag out, and it's just like, you know, I'm for I'm he ain't gonna apologize, so I gotta do it. I know I gotta do it. I don't want to do it because I know I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you know the story was gonna go that way? By the way, I wasn't right. <laughs> it took a while to see. It's like, oh, and by the way, I think you you're actually right, Brian. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. It's like dreading this conversation because this is going to go one of two ways. You know, it's probably, I actually think it's only going to go one way, and that's one of us is getting in a vehicle and going home and not coming back. But, you know, we worked out, it's like, we spent the whole afternoon talking. And we wound up telling stories because he's got great stories. But we spent hours and hashed out things we didn't even realize was festering. And you're like, man, we should have done that a long time ago. But we're good now. Now we can let it all build up again until we have to do it again, which... We did, you know, that's just the way it is. But you dread those conversations, and then when you actually get into them, it's like, why, why did we harbor this? Why didn't we get into this? Like, I've knew people that hadn't talked to each other for 20 years. They were business associates. And it's like, well, what's, what's like, I don't even remember what we're, literally said, I don't remember why we're fighting. It's just, we don't talk to each other anymore. It's like, don't you think it's kind of stupid? It, but yeah, that's that's human nature. That's what we do. Our conversation on the way home was a lot better. Good. I it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, can you? But many times it takes one to do the giving in. You know, to well, like the Holy Spirit is. <laughs> Some somebody has to bend. Yeah. 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 I I. Yeah, right. Depends who your husband is. <laughs> I'm as pure as a driven snow. I have no, no, no idea what you're no, talking about. I mean, he's always right. It's except, very annoying. Except when he's wrong. We That's what I've been saying, but we yeah. That, so we know that you're always right now. 
<laughs> yeah, it doesn't always go that way. But don't forget, he has to take the lumps for it if he's wrong. <laughs> this is true. That's why he used to get George. Okay, I'll do it. If it turns to you, it's on you. I know better, but... My mom was always famous for that. It's like, well, yeah, you know, go ahead. And she was a businesswoman. Too. It's like, well, you can go ahead and do it that way. I still don't think you're right. So when this comes back and bites you, it's on you. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you know? Yeah, she was right a lot. <laughs> and I was just like, how does she do that? She doesn't know. It. I was like, you know, she, inherit, she inherited the business. So everybody was like, yeah, you just let us do the, mm -hmm, and you just manage the money because you don't know anything about this business. And it's like, Every time she opened up her mouth and said something that wound up being, most of the time was right. And they're just like, oh, she's going to be unbearable to live with now. But... Instead of saying, I told you so, you start saying, holy, holy, holy. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Is that before focus factor? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so... You know, God shows mercy when he sees in us a desire to please him, even if we haven't kept all the rules, but we mustn't presume upon his mercy. Yeah, uh, every time, and you know what? I don't know how I could have said that any different, but anytime we try to put that into words, it always sounds like, yeah, we make mistakes, but God loves us anyway. And we kind of spongify it. And it's like, well, yeah, God does love you, but he really doesn't like sin too much. But there's no way, I don't think we even have the words to explain it succinctly and clearly that, yeah, our human nature is sinful. God wants us to be penitent and repentant. Uh, but, you know, don't presume his mercy is the, the phrase I like. It's like, just don't presume, well, I did this, but I know God forgives me. It's like, yeah, mm, you're taking it for granted. Yeah, you're taking it for granted. And often there's still punishment involved. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like being a mom and you have a two-year-old child you love that child dearly and but you still have to discipline you know mm -hmm. sometimes and they do something which agitates but that doesn't you don't allow that to get in the way of your love for that child mm -hmm. yeah exactly yep Now it's a little tougher when the child is like 15 or 16. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that's where we're going to stop for this week, I think. That was a good discussion this week. I like that. So, we'll touch briefly on the glory cloud next week. We do talk about the glory cloud pretty frequently. Uh, in our Bible classes. So just the presence, the presence of God. We'll touch on that and then we'll get back into the text of Hebrews, finish up our discussion of Christians as co-priests with Christ. And then we will get into the, uh, get into the band of brothers in Hebrews chapter three. Okay, so that is where we'll pick up next week.